So as I mentioned in the last video, is industrialized nations in the West needed to expand more. Uh, and to expand more, they had to start colonizing the agrarian countries and that were located outside of modern Europe. And the colonized countries, basically, the idea there is that colonized countries would provide uh, raw materials for export. In exchange, they received uh, cheaply manufactured Western goods. Now, one of the things this did is it actually hurt the local economies. So it hurt the local economies because they no longer were producing those goods, and, and those goods were instead being supplanted by those they could get more cheaply from the West. And that certainly had a pretty significant impact in how they grew. Uh, and the Western ethos essentially forced onto these colonized countries um, you know, an, a certain approach. And, and I think that ethos was enforced upon them at too rapid and too unsettling of a pace. Remember, the West had hundreds of years to adapt. It, it, you know, the Industrial Revolution, prior to that, there was sort of the Innovation Revolution in the 1600s. So it literally had hundreds of years to adapt to its way of life. But trying to push that same way of life onto somebody else in a far shorter amount of time uh, was going to prove both unsettling and probably too rapid. And as Karen Armstrong wrote, quote, the Islamic world had been convulsed by the modernization process. So what really began to happen in terms of how colonization took place? Well, one of the key dates is, is in the second half of the 18th century. So about second half, second half of the 18th century, what happened was that um, the British started to invade Mughal India, and specifically, they started establishing footholds in Bengal, and, and that region is located, um, I'm going to show you right on the map, right around here in India, okay? And this phase was known as the plundering of Bengal, the plundering of Bengal. Why was that? And it was because what essentially happened is that the Bengalis shifted away from growing crops from themselves, and they instead began to provide raw materials to the British. Uh, and the British, in turn, because they were providing back goods and services, they began to damage the, the local industry. And so the British began to take stronghold uh, in India. In 1793, uh, Protestant missionaries arrived. So they had Protestant missionaries arriving in India, and their goal was to, quote, unquote, help civilize Indians. And that's, that's how they put it. Um, and uh, that was also a, a major inflection point in the uh, in Indian history. Uh, and then from about 1798, from 1798 until 1818, uh, basically through treaties or military conquest, uh, British rule was pretty much established everywhere except the Indus Valley. So basically, the British British rule established everywhere except the Indus Valley, except the Indus Valley. So this was, uh, you know, they really were taking over all of India at this point. Okay, and then from 1843 to 1849, this is really where the Indus Valley was subdued. And they basically, at this point, really took over all of India. subdued. All right. Now, while this was all going on, uh, the French, and they were led by Napoleon, were trying to establish their own empire. So right around 1798, uh, basically Napoleon tried to occupy Egypt. So Napoleon tried to occupy Egypt. And, you know, here's, here's Egypt on this map right here. And while occupying Egypt, he also was trying to establish a base in the Suez that would essentially cut British sea routes to India. And he had actually failed ultimately in his ex expeditions to both Egypt and also to Syria, which is located right here. And so what Napoleon then decided that he wanted to do was um, really to go after British India from the north. And I would mention one quote from the book, that when Napoleon arrived in Egypt, he brought with him, quote, a corps of soldiers, of, of scholars, a library of modern European literature, a scientific laboratory, and a printing press with Arabic types. So he really came uh, prepared for his mission. But because he wasn't able to carry out in the, in the way that he wanted to, um, he decided he wanted to go after British India from the north. So he kind of wanted to come 
um, at India from, from this angle right here. And obviously, uh, for him to be able to do that, he did need um, the help of the uh, the Soviets uh, and the Russians actually. And, and you know, he would um, ultimately what he what he would really need to do is he would need um, to be able to do is he would really need to. I guess Iran maybe became a very central and a very critical. Um, it took on a very critical position in this whole. Uh, in this whole scheme of things. So the British basically were trying to control, given the importance of Iran, the British were trying to control Iran from the south, and the Russians tried to control it from the north, which, which you might expect since um, you know, they're coming from up here anyway. So this is kind of the direction the Russians came from. They came from the north, and the, the, British, the British were kind of coming towards Iran from the south. All right, now one interesting thing is that at this point in history, Oil had not yet been discovered in Iran, and so um, and that would obviously happen much later in, in the 20th century. So neither the the British nor the Russians really had any broader interest in colonizing Iran. They were just interested in it as a uh, given its its central location to everyone's attempts to get to India. All right. Now both Britain and Russia did promote. Uh, technical progress, but really that they promoted technical progress that primarily aided their missions, but really hindered those that did not. So they, for example, blocked things like the railway, fearing it would endanger their own strategic positions. And from this point onward, there were a whole series of uh, additional occupations, and I'm going to mention some of those occupation and colonization in the next video.